Hey folks, this is Riker with my review of newly released action RPG Torchlight 3. And I'm not going to make you wait until the end of the video, I'm going to give you my final verdict right now. Torchlight 3 is a competent action RPG with earnest developers that have been exceedingly active in their community. The game has all the elements we come to expect in an action RPG, but it feels on the smaller side compared to what else is out there. However, the game does leave itself room to grow. On the scale of depth, it's on the shallower end of the ARPG spectrum, without being super shallow. But if you're looking for a Path of Exile levels of depth, this game will not scratch your itch. But if you're content with something more akin to Diablo 3 when it comes to depth, there's certainly enough in here. So let's dive into a breakdown now. Torchlight 3 is out now on Steam, Xbox One, and PS4, and it's going to come to Nintendo Switch on October 22nd. Right off the bat here, you have the option to play single player or multiplayer. Single player would be offline. When you're creating a hero, you can select between one of four classes. There's the sharpshooter, your archer archetype, the dusk mage, your sorcerer archetype, the forged, which fits pretty much no archetype, and the Railmaster, which also fits no archetype. These classes are all very unique. Even the Dusk Mage, being a wizard archetype, it's got a unique aspect in that it revolves around two different types of magic and balancing this dark and light magic. And you want to basically create some kind of hybrid build, or you could, I guess you don't have to, you can play it however you want, but hybrid gameplay is encouraged because one type of magic will give you s some kind of buff and the other will do something else. So it's an interesting play style and it's a unique take on the stereotypical mage. The sharpshooter is probably the closest thing to a vanilla class, but even that has a little twist in it in that it has a resource mechanic that is effectively arrows. As you're shooting arrows, you actually see your little arrows depleting and they will regenerate over time. The Railmaster's unique mechanic is that he lays down a train that will follow him along. In that sense, it's maybe a bit of a pet build, but you can choose to customize, enhance that train in different ways depending on what skills you take. The train will have different carts. You can have a shotgun cart or a flamethrower cart depending on how you build your character. And the Forged is a robot with a unique mechanic in that it vents heat. As it uses its abilities, it builds up heat and then it can overheat, but you have other abilities that will vent heat. So there's that interesting balance. Every class has something to it. Nothing here is really pure vanilla. And then when you select a class, you got all manner of different character customization options, and you also get to pick at the start your relic. Now, one thing that's important to note here is if we go back, you can see that Every class has two skill trees. So for the Dusk Mage, it's dark and light. These are individual skill trees that progress from left to right as you level up. When you get a skill point, you can allocate it into either skill tree, but also you're going to get a third skill tree via your relic of choice. Basically, you have your fire, lightning, cold, poison, and bleed relic. And each of these has all manner of different things. So by this menu, you're able to see what your finalized build would look like, or at least your finalized set of skill trees that you can then plan your build around, because your relic gives you access to another skill tree, and then whenever you get skill points, you choose where you allocate it. You can put multiple points into each of these. As you put points into them, you unlock higher tier bonuses in addition to just gaining a numerical buff. So it's important when planning out your build that you're looking at all three of these skill trees. So as an example in game here on my archer, I'm only level 9, but I have over 50 hours put into this game. It's just has been a character wipe, and I haven't had time to play much since then. But I'm on the archer here, and you can see we got the precision skill tree. I'm putting a lot of points into tight grouping, which is like multi-shot. But there's all manner of other skills that we can eventually build towards. As you go up in level, more unlocks and becomes available to you. The adventurer skill tree is the other skill tree for the ranger. Here I like to have my mobility skill, ghost visage, most classes have some mobility skill. Sometimes you just want to put one point into something. Sometimes it's worth investing multiple points. You're making the choice of, well, do I want to put enough points to unlock the tier one bonus, the tier two bonus? Of course, here we have the relic skills. Some of these are passive. You just put points and they're going to apply passively. Some of them unlock additional skills. As you can see down here, we can have a total of nine skills equipped. One through seven, left click and right click. From past play experiences, I definitely did not have any form of shortage of skills. In fact, uh, earlier in the game's development, you had far fewer skills 
And once they opened this up, I actually reached a point where it's like, oh wow, I actually don't know what else to put, what else to work into my build here. So we definitely have enough active skill slots. And I should mention that I've followed this game's development for years, back when it was first revealed as Torchlight Frontiers. I've seen the way it's evolved and changed over the months and years. Now another thing that you'll note here is your Legendarium. Now this is something very interesting. It's also playing into how you build your character, but it's not permanent choices. It's a little bit like a Kanai's cube slot in Diablo 3, and it lets you passively select the legendary abilities of legendary items you have found. Now you start off with a set of basic items you can select, but then as you find certain other items, they become available. So these are the suite of items you begin with that you can put in there. As you level up, you unlock more of these slots, and depending on what build you go with, some of these will be more or less useful to you. So this also plays into your build planning. And then the last part of your build is your pet skills, because this game has a pet system. You have a pet that follows you around. It will help you in combat. You can select up to eventually four pet skills that you unlock. As you find pets, pets will randomly have some skill on them, and that's how you unlock additional pet skills. You have some basic suite of pet skills and then Collecting pets is a part of the game. There's all kinds of different pets, from alpacas to golden retrievers to owls, cats, you name it. And then these pet skills can be freely swapped as well, but again, it's about having to unlock all of them over time. So these are the five pages of build planning or build building that you have. And then of course the last aspect would be your inventory itself, the items that you wear, that you equip, your pet as well gets items that you can equip, and as we said, the pet helps you in combat, the pet also serves as an extra inventory, and you can send the pet back to town to sell gear. You're out adventuring, you shove a bunch of stuff onto your pet, you hit send pet to town, he'll come back in a minute or two after having sold all the stuff without you having to return to town. Very nice little system. Going back to itemization, it's pretty straightforward if you're accustomed to action RPGs. Items have different rarities, different levels. One very integral part of Torchlight 3 is resistances. There are zones in the game and every zone is keyed specifically to a certain element. That doesn't mean all the monsters there will deal that elemental damage type, but in general, Act 1, you want a lot of fire resistance. In general, Act 2, you want a lot of poison resistance. In general, Act 3, you want a lot of lightning resistance. And then when you get to end game, that's when things get a little more complicated. The game also offers a number of consumables. There are potions, different types of health potion, potions that'll do other things as well. We have consumables like respectacles. These are the respect points that you can find. So you can respect your skill points, but it comes at a cost. There's also something called a scroll of life bound. This basically allows you to enhance an item. It'll become more powerful, but if you die, the item is destroyed. It's basically an opt-in semi-hardcore system. And you'll find other consumables that'll either give you gold or cosmetics, which we'll get to a little bit more in a bit. Resources here. Throughout the game world, you're going to be able to find stone outcroppings, trees. You can mine these resources. And these pretty much all exclusively play into the base building, the fort building, the hideout, player housing type of system. Now if we go up here to the contract system, I just clicked up here on contracts. This is an interesting little progression system. It's a little bit like a battle pass, but it's free. There are no microtransactions in this game. This is a buy once game, zero MTX, but you can see a little bit of the remnants of back when this probably was being designed as a, a free to play with MTX game model, back when it was going to be Torchlight Frontiers, before they change production to make it be uh, Torchlight 3, uh, a sequel to Torchlight 2. So you can see I've already unlocked a number of rewards, let's claim them here. This is a recipe for a legendary weapon because we can craft items, more crafting materials, we're going to claim this here. And so basically, the contracts work on fame points. You gain fame points by killing elites, bosses, important monsters, and that allows you to progress along your contract. You can see over here, the next objective for me is a rare fort plan. This is just a cosmetic, but again, it's a nice little way to unlock cosmetic rewards. Sometimes there are more meaningful rewards. I mean, depending on your playstyle, of course. Here there's gold, here there's a respectable, here there's a crafting recipe. So in this contract, there's sort of a mishmash of cosmetic and functional rewards, but we can switch contract 
to a craftsman contract, which is going to be more practical things, or to a homesteader's contract, which is going to be more cosmetic things. So you can really customize whatever contract you want, and you can just, you know, make active. I can swap here, and I didn't lose anything, right? I'm still progressed along 35 out of 333 of the next level. So it's just a nice little extra progression system. And by the way, when you reach the end, which you will, once you reach the end, it's not the end forever. It will go on. It will keep cycling, there's always going to be more contracts for you to do. It's a nice way to work in a reward system that encourages you to go after elite monsters and give you another sense of progression because we're RPG players, we love our progression systems. Now I'm going to go to the map up here and through this we can take a look at the game world. So we have our Act 1 here, the Goblin Forest, we move over to Act 2, the Infested Forest, and over to Act 3, the Echonoc mountains. Personally, I think Act 3 is the coolest of the three acts. I feel it is the most visually and thematically distinct. I really, really like the Okanok Mountains. It's this sort of strange dwarf, steampunk, evil vulture. It's really unique. And I wish it was actually Act 1, because Act 1 is very relatively vanilla. It's goblins and skeletons. And it's stuff we've seen before quite a bit in other games, other MMOs, other RPGs. I feel that Equinox Mountains would have made a much stronger first impression of the game as something really distinct. Because that's the one thing, well, that's one of the things about Torchlight, is that it's, in general, very distinct. It's classes, all very distinct. It's visual style, very distinct amongst other action RPGs. But talking a little bit more about the campaign, again, we have a three-act campaign. The environments themselves, they're very well detailed. I wouldn't say that within every act there's an enormous variety of different areas. I think it's pretty obvious wherever you are, it's pretty obvious which of the three acts you find yourself in. I overall have this impression and I can't quite figure out why I have this sense, but I feel like the game world is small, and it might be because kind of all the Goblin Forest zones look very similar, all the Infested Forest zones look very similar, all the Equinox Mountain zones look very similar. I don't know if that's the impression they were going for, but I feel relative to certain other ARPGs, where, where it feels like you really explore more of the setting, more of the game world. I feel like the story being told in Torchlight 3 is of a smaller scale, which it's not a it's not a criticism, but I am certainly left with the impression of, oh, well, there's still like a whole other huge part of this world to explore. And maybe that's the idea. Maybe the idea is to build towards more acts in the future and really flesh out the world. Right off the bat, because we have fire, poison, and lightning, there already is room for a fourth act with cold. We don't yet have representation of all the elements. And now I'm going to go to my fort over here, which... Oh, look at that. The default fort layout is much nicer. It used to just be basically a, a tabula rasa or some so-so eh, decor. This is actually a lot nicer as the default fort. We can completely customize the layout of everything here. You want to move this? You can move that wherever you want. You can move that. You can rotate it however you see fit. So, the real end game here is fort decoration. I'm a big fan of player housing in general, and there is form and function going on here. There is aesthetics. See here, I've gotten just an aesthetic trophy that I can take, and I can I can put that over here, blocking the path of those coming in. And there's function as well. There's the, the Luck Sprout, which will make the Luck Tree. Let's put this over here. And the luxury has a very specific function to it, which we'll get into in a little bit here. But basically, again, fort decoration, form and function going on. So we go over here, we got our stash, and again, we can move everything around. We have three stash tabs. The luck tree, the luck sprout here, will grow into a luck tree. Basically, you can choose to either vendor items to gain gold, or you can feed magic items to the luck tree, and it's going to grow. As you can see up here, plus 1% gear luck. As we feed this, I think this goes up to plus 5% gear luck. So it's not something huge. You're not going to get plus 50% magic find from this. But it's a nice little thing to work for towards the end game. 5% gear luck. Again, I'm not 100% sure if that's what it is at the, at the highest level. But it's a buff that once you get to end game is noticeable. It's something to build towards over time. Again, it's just another progression system. We're RPG players. We like progression. Now, if we go back into our fort customization, we can see up here... We have storage, so we can build a pet shelter, and the pet shelter is basically where we can go to select 
all the different pets that we have, that we have unlocked and we can pick from. So you can see here, these are the pets that I've found so far, and I have the option to select any of these, and you can see pets have different rarities, and the higher rarity pets I think will unlock perhaps uh, what the game considers better uh, pet skills. I'm not 100% sure about that, but these are all the ones in addition to the pet that I created at character creation, but you're never forced to pick a different pet based on the skill. If you're really attached to the pet you created, you can always stick with that pet. As you find additional pets, they will unlock the skill. The skill isn't tied to the pet specifically. So you can take the skill that was unlocked by Atticus here and put it on Mr. Llama. Now going back in here under functional, we have a number of buildings that we can create, the sawmill, the spelter, and the stonemason. These all take our raw resources and build them into things that can then be used in order to create more fort decorations. We have the training dummy here, which lets us basically have a practice doll to test our DPS against. Then we have more progression systems similar to the luck tree. These are very interesting. This is one for every act, I believe. And so if we build this, as we kill goblins, we're going to collect Goblin Fury, which will grow this monument. And as it grows, we build up permanent fire defense bonus. This one gives us gold bonuses. This one gives us poison defense bonuses. So these are similar systems to the luck tree. It's another form of progression in the game that gives small, but nonetheless noted bonuses. And then lastly here we have the skill station. The Arcanum is for the Dusk Mage, the Arms Cart is for the Sharpshooters, Automaton Shop is for the Forge, and Workshop is for the Railmaster, so every class gets one of these. It's where they can unlearn skill levels with respectable points. Then back under storage here, on this tab, we can build a number of... They're basically statues that can hold gear sets for us. So they're wardrobes or they're armories, so let's say you want to have your fire defense item set, your poison defense item set, and your lightning defense item set, you can build yourself different figures and then you can outfit them with gear. They serve both a decorational and functional purpose. Now in addition to this, I'm not able to show it to you because now it unlocks at higher level, but there's a crafting system. You can basically melt down items that turns them into materials and then you are able to, uh, eventually you start finding items that have slots on them. They're like sockets, but they're sockets for enchants. And you can roll enchants onto the items to fill uh, the sockets. If there's two sockets, you can roll two enchants onto it. And evidently you can pick between different enchants. I don't think you can pick exactly the enchant you want, but uh, you know, here's an enchant that might give one of these four different things, for instance. Then the current end game in Torchlight 3, once you've completed the campaign, is something called Fazir's Dungeon. This is Torchlight 3's take on rifts or maps, and in Fazir's Dungeon Challenge, you're basically progressing through increasingly difficult dungeon levels. These dungeons will have modifiers on them to increase the difficulty, and as you go higher and higher, these become increasingly challenging. Now, before you go into one of these dungeons, you're presented with a series of three cards. And these cards will define basically what the dungeon will entail. There'll be beneficial affixes, there'll be detrimental affixes, there'll be different monster types. And so you want to evaluate, okay, which of these three dungeons do I want to tackle? Every few dungeons, there's going to be a boss to tackle. And once you defeat the boss, that's basically your checkpoint. Because if you die at the boss or any time before, you get reset to the last checkpoint. So there's a checkpoint maybe every, I don't know, three, four dungeons or so. So it's a nice end game system. I don't have extensive experience with it. I was trying it out. I was enjoying it. So I circle back to what I said at the start, that Torchlight 3 is a competent action RPG. It's not exceptional, but it is competent. Now it's been a very long time since I played Torchlight 2 eight years to be precise. But I remember being very taken with the game. At the time I was working as a video game journalist, I wrote my Outlet's review for Torchlight 2, I gave it a very high score, and I believe I even awarded it my Game of the Year pick. I don't find myself as taken with Torchlight 3 as I did with Torchlight 2, but I'm not sure if that's because I've experienced 
Torchlight 3's growing pains over the months and years, or if just maybe after eight years of competition and evolution of the genre, my expectations for ARPGs has grown. Now to talk a little bit more about the developers of Torchlight 3, who are some but not all of the developers of Torchlight 2, which includes some of the people who worked on Diablo 1 and Diablo 2, including Max Schaefer, one of the fathers of Diablo. Throughout Torchlight 3's development, it really felt like the devs wanted to make a game that would make Torchlight fans happy. They went so far as to scrap their original idea of Torchlight Frontiers, this free-to-play, more MMO-y type of game, and transform that into Torchlight 3, a true sequel to Torchlight 2. This was based on feedback, after months of feedback, and I'm sure this was a very difficult decision for them to make. And then throughout Alpha, time and again, we've seen the devs being very, very, very active within their community, on streams, in their Discord, their forums, all over the place, connecting with their community, getting that feedback, understanding that feedback, and we've seen changes made throughout development based on that player feedback that have steered the game in a positive direction. And I do sincerely hope that the devs do and will have the ability to continue to support this game on an ongoing basis, build upon it, continue to connect and stay connected with the community. So to my final recommendation, to answer the question that I'm going to get asked 50 million times, do I recommend Torchlight 3 or the way I hate when it's phrased, should I buy Torchlight 3? I don't know your financial situation, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money. What I will tell you is that Torchlight 3 is a fun game. I had fun playing it, I enjoyed my time with it, I would like to spend more time playing with it. Steam tells me I have about 56 hours logged of Torchlight 3 and I feel I could keep going and keep enjoying myself. I don't know if this is a game that can last a thousand hours. Will my fun cap out at a hundred hours? I don't know. But I definitely feel like I got my money's worth, and if they continue to add content, build upon what they have, I can see that life of the game being extended further. And that's going to wrap up this video. As a reminder, if you want to get your name on the Rikers Raiders 2020 banner, you have until the end of October. All it takes is $1 pledged on patreon.com slash Riker. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind the scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more ARPG content.